Well, Alex O'Connor gave an impressive talk at uh, the Oxford Union that received a lot of attention, and it was part of a larger debate over the question of, is God a delusion? Now, his points were undeniably powerful and well-spoken, and they even rocked me a little. But on further reflection, I went from rocked a little to being more confident in my belief that God is not, in fact, a delusion than before I listened to his talk. And I want to pass on some points to you to help you with that as well. I'll be focusing on Alex's introductory comments. He opens by joking about Michael Shermer uh, was the original scheduled speaker on the debate team, uh, but couldn't make it. So Alex was brought in as a replacement. Watch this. I won't go as far, especially given the circumstances, circumstances to call this providence. However, it does leave you with a slight sense that there might have been more than chance at play in bringing me to this chamber tonight, but it is exactly that kind of thinking, the seeking of agency and design where there is in fact none that I've traveled here in an attempt to dispel. So he's setting up by saying that seeking agency and design where there is in fact none is what belief in God is. It's a psychological phenomenon where humans are placing design on top of things where it truly doesn't exist. Now he goes on to give an example from Ayan Hirsi Ali's recent conversion as a case in point, arguing that narrative conversion stories are typically how we hear about faith uh, as opposed to well-reasoned arguments. I wonder how relevant these really are to God belief. That is, when you hear somebody recounting a conversion story, how often does it really begin with premise one? You're more likely to hear a narrative or a story, some kind of account of an experience. Indeed, the most high-profile conversion, perhaps of this millennium, happened just a few weeks ago when the fifth horsewoman of new atheism, Ayan Hirsi Ali, announced in a long and celebrated essay that she had embraced Christianity. I was far from the first reviewer to notice something rather peculiar about this publication. That is, its somewhat conspicuous lack of arguments for the existence of God or for the truth of Christianity. Instead, she devoted the entire thing to talking about culture. She talked about the looming threats of Russia and China of global Islamism, of wokeism. If you're not familiar with Ayan Hirsi Ali's conversion, check out our video where we do talk about that. Now, it is true in the essay he's referring to, it's called Why I Am Now a Christian. She spends a lot of her time talking about Western civilization and the dangers it faces, how that helped her move on to embrace Christianity. Now, O'Connor chastises her for not addressing the existence of God or the truth claims of Christianity in her reasons that she gives in that essay. Uh, then he accuses her of escapism. Now, I couldn't agree more that people should examine the arguments for the existence of God and certainly Christian truth claims. Uh, the early Christian movement was uh, fueled by the proclamation of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus as objective realities, not just sentimental religious ideas. However, I would point out that Ayan Hirsi Ali did the very thing that O'Connor goes on to in the very next section, invite all of us to do, and she reached a far different conclusion than he does. Here's what I mean. Alex poses a difficult question and provides his own answer. Here, watch. I will simply ask a question of you. What would you expect to see if God existed? And all of this was being supervised. What would you expect the world to look like? How would you expect life to have evolved? And if we assume the alternative hypothesis, that is atheism, materialism, that is, that the world we find ourselves in is just an amoral arena of accidentally existing organisms competing in an endless struggle for survival. What would we expect to find? And what do we find? A system of natural selection which explains the origin of species on planet Earth that does not just cause or bring about, but relies upon suffering and death. Survival of the fittest is the same thing as the death and destruction of the unfit. 99% plus of all of the species, species, let alone animals, that have ever inhabited this planet have been brutally wiped from existence. And for what? For our development? It seems that unimaginable, indescribable, and seemingly inexplicable suffering is embedded into the very mechanism by which I'm told God decided to create human beings. So the question is, what would you expect to see if the universe was created by God? And he provides the answer. You would not see what we do see. 
the, the suffering embedded in the system and the survival of the fittest. And that's why I said he makes a heavy point. And he offers an alternative hypothesis that he claims better explains what we experience. Listen to his words again. He says this, atheist materialism, which gives us an amoral arena of accidentally existing organisms competing in an endless struggle for survival. Now this is Alex's declaration about ultimate reality. This is what we see according to him. This is what is and going back to his stated goal in the beginning, all of the God talk is finding providence, design, and purpose where there is none. Now, believers in God are guilty of a delusion. Uh, th that's plenty to examine because it, it gets things down to the root system of diametrically opposed worldviews. Ultimate reality, according to Alex O'Connor, is materialistic. That means physical entities are all there is. There is no supernatural or transcendent, either mind or morals. All organisms, including human beings, by the, uh, by the way, are accidentally existing, according to him. So to drive this point home, I think it's fair to import onto O'Connor's description of reality a couple of others who share his worldview. Uh, Richard Dawkins famously said something very similar, which summed up the materialist view of reality. Quote, the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we would expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And I have to add in, there's Bertrand Russell's famous poetic tripling down on this whole concept where he said that man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and his fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocation of Adam. This is something you just need to embrace, according to Russell. Okay, this is important to nail down. Uh, we have the cards in our hands at this point now, and Alex has invited us to ask the question, if God existed, what would we expect to see? Uh, we also need to ask, though, if God did not exist, what would we expect to see? Now, first, you, you can watch for yourself. He acknowledges that Christians do have an answer for the dilemma in which we find ourselves, but he, he does it in kind of this rhetorical hand-waving manner uh, that reduces God's grander plan to basically dogs going to heaven. Uh, now, with that in mind, it's worth noting that the biblical worldview of the grander plan is something deeper and worthy of serious reflection. In, in short, it says that the universe that you see was built as good, good having definition. And that good was corrupted and poisoned by evil, and the universe is now suffering under a bondage that is foreign to its original design, but will be released and redeemed in the future. That's why the life and the death and resurrection of Jesus is so important. Those three movements are a summary picture of the entire grander story. Now, what Alex O'Connor has done here is what I think everyone should do, and what I would argue Ayan Hirsi Ali did and O'Connor doesn't give her credit for it. He challenges us to take things back to the fundamentals of reality as we experience it and ask, if one thing is true, what would you expect? Follow the logical conclusions. In other words, get things down to worldviews. Which worldview stands up to the test of reality? And here's the essential difference between the two. O'Connor, Dawkins, Russell all say the same thing in different ways. Life at its bottom is material or consisting of physical matter, which is accidental, undesigned, unintended, and unguided by anything outside of itself. It is self-produced. And the phenomenon we call and label mind is a product of that process. Now in short, according to them, matter came first and produced mind. That's why you see all the chaos and the suffering. Okay, the Christ-centered worldview is its opposite. And it's summed up well in the book of John where the writer opens by saying, in the beginning was the logos, which was the Greek word for intention, design, you know, rationality, uh, the category of our experience we associate with mind. In other words, mind came before matter and produced matter. And if we keep our eyes on that distinction, it'll help us a lot. All right, much greater thinkers than me have all wrestled with the problem. If at bottom everything is without purpose and it's accidental, without good or evil and indifferent, uh, that presents a challenge to our experience because it takes away the foundation of good, evil, meaning, and purpose. Now, I also kind of treated Ayan Hirsi Ali unfairly in my view. Uh, while she did not wrestle openly in the essay about the existence of God as like traditionally understood by saying she was really convinced by the teleological or the ontological arguments for his existence, what she did say was there were two reasons for her conversion. One was cultural, 
but the other was personal. Here's her words. Quote, Yet I would not be truthful if I attributed my embrace of Christianity solely to the realization that atheism is too weak and divisive a doctrine to fortify us against our menacing foes. I have also turned to Christianity because I ultimately found life without any spiritual solace unendurable, indeed very nearly self-destructive. Atheism failed to answer a simple question. What is the meaning and purpose of life? Now think about this. As the fifth horsewoman of the new atheism, as O'Connor called her, uh, and a close friend of Richard Dawkins, she walked around and tried to live her life consistent with the declarations made by Dawkins and O'Connor and Russell, and presumably herself, and she declared it unendurable. Well, why? Because it fails to answer the question of meaning. Not only that, I, I would add it fails to answer the question, how did an accidental, unguided, undesigned process produce minds that see life as purposeful, guided, and designed. Uh, these are the very characteristics that we associate with the term mind, rationality, and logic. All of the mental categories that give meaning to the idea that we have minds rely on the concepts that the naturalist would insist the universe itself doesn't have. And that introduces a very important problem that Ali was struggling with. If there is, at bottom, no good or evil, uh, or design or purpose, then our experience of those ideas are all our placing of those ideas upon reality as we see it. Uh, the material entities that, that make up our minds are simply producing the sensations of what we label, like goodness or morality or choice or beauty. Now, you don't have to look far in the naturalist literature and, and worldview to discover, in the attempt to be logically consistent, a skepticism around, for instance, say, free will. Uh, most naturalists are determinists, meaning our choices that we perceive as choices are not really choices in the strict sense. They're inevitabilities constructed by physical processes that only appear to us as choices. In other words, they're delusions. Uh, they are seeing order and design where it doesn't exist. Now, when you and I make a sandwich, we, we experience this as a series of artful choices. But on the naturalism, we're kidding ourselves if we think that mental movement going on in our heads is what we label as choice. Now the same goes for morals. Uh, few, if any, experience morals as mere movements of impersonal accidental molecules in our heads telling us to care about, say, social justice. On the contrary, we're all moralists. Even O'Connor, in his presentation, he goes on to rightly chastise the church for its moral abuses. But if at bottom there's no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, why do we have the powerful experience of being called to this higher standard which we ought to obey? Again, on naturalism, all moralizing in the end is a delusion, a very useful and important delusion, but ultimately a delusion. Uh, the same could be said for our perceptions of goodness, beauty, falling in love, having our souls lifted by great music, or the sight of our own child, or some jaw-dropping piece of art. We have the experience of it, and it seems to mean something. But in a universe that has no actual good, each of these experiences must be labeled delusional. In other words, finding design and purpose where there is, in fact, none. Ali's essay is very much about the existence of God and the truth claims of the Christian faith. What she was saying is that naturalism fails because it's not livable in its logical conclusions for society or individually. Well, that's certainly a part of any truth test. Is God a delusion? If you say so and remove him altogether and leave all of us to the undesigned movements of atoms, is our experience of choice, beauty, meaning, morals a delusion as well? And if it is, what are my obligations to that in response? With Ayan Hersili, I'd say atheism fails to answer the question, what is the purpose and meaning of life? I hope that helps. See you next time.